Hey, what's going on? This is Rad with another special edition of Soft Rep. You know me as the man behind the glasses right here that I've always got on. But today I want to give you a little bit of my soul because I'm going to talk to the one and only Vincent Vargas, aka Rocco. And if you know who Vincent Vargas is, he's the actor. He plays Gilly on Mayans MC. He's an author. He's a singer, rapper, father, ranger, border patrol, secret something agent guy. And uh, it's got a great smile. So I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a great intro. <laughs> well, it's it, it just flies right off the tongue naturally. Uh, Rocco, <laughs> Vincent, you know, how old are you? Uh, I'm 41. 41. And you have a resume yeah. that supersedes most people's lives already at 41. So... Look, yeah. let's, 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 so this is soft rep radio. We talk about veterans and how they've come from where they used to be and how they are today. And there's a military background yep. in your history, right? And, and I said ranger mm -hmm. out there. And so, uh, tell me a little bit about what made you join the military, how old you were and why you chose ranger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was 23 years old and my baseball career came to an end. Uh, all because of me, right? I didn't make the smart choices and I became academically ineligible and I lost a full ride scholarship. Um, I tried to continue to play other places, but kept getting cut. There's a lot of reasons why uh, the baseball career didn't continue. One, because I was extremely immature. Two, I was into the drinking scene and I didn't take baseball serious, you know? So that was my intro into what's next. Uh, as I was sitting at a bar, I was working at Texas Roadhouse, uh, and when we finished shift, we'd all head over to Buffalo Wild Wings. I was watching a, a Marine on TV putting a flag over the Saddam statue and as they're pulling it down, and I saw his family super proud of him, right? They, they, were, they interviewed with that family. They were crying with, with joy, and uh, I kind of like did a little self-reflection like, damn, I, I don't think my parents at any moment of my life so far have been proud of, you know, because I've made a lot of mistakes. I continue to do these stupid things, these immature things that uh, are not beneficial to my, to my career field or to my life, right? And so um, that was the first kind of initial watching that and saying, oh shit, I should try and do something better with myself. And then I also had a daughter who was just recently born at the time, you know, me and, me and her mom weren't very close. We kind of had a real ugly relationship early on. And so I was just like, well, how can I be a good dad as well? Because that's something I've always wanted to be as a dad, right? I've always wanted to be a father. But, you know, circumstances had it. I was having I was having a baby at a really young age that I wasn't expecting. And at the same time, uh, you know, I was kind of lost in my own world with baseball. And so watching that dude on TV, I was like, you know what, fuck it. Let's go to uh, let's go to the recruiter and see what's there for me. Um, right. I always knew that I was athletic enough to do something challenging. And so I was like, well, if I'm going to do it, let's go all in. I'm going to be infantry for sure. And I'm going to be special operations of some sort. I didn't really know anything about special operations, just knew, you know, Black Hawk Down, the movie was something that I, I just really enjoyed. And so uh, the Ranger kind of conversation was always in my face. I took the ASVAB and scored a 108 on the GT score, and that oh. wasn't high enough to do SF. So it pushed me out of the running for SF. And so the option 40 contract, it is. <clears throat> they played the game like they didn't have any. And I said, OK, well, hit me up when you do. You know, um, I'll still play some baseball on the side, a couple little independent teams sure. and, and just kill, kind of keeping that dream alive. But I knew if I had an option to go option 40, I was going to go. And I wasn't in any hurry in the sense where if they were going to kind of play games with me, I, I didn't need it. I was I mean, I had a full time job and I was figuring it out already. So you're a pitcher. Is that what's up or what position is your position? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was a. You know, I think I was a better hitter outfielder, but being left-handed, you know, I was kind of yeah. pushed into pitching more often. Um, by the time I finished my career out in Brush University, I was I was an outfielder for most of the game, and then I come in and close, you know, and yeah. so it just kind of was the best of both worlds. I was able to, you know, they didn't take the bat out of my hand, which I was blessed about. I really enjoy hitting. Yes. And uh, I enjoyed running down balls in the outfield, man. It was, I really I really loved the, the position of outfield, but, uh, you know, I can throw – pretty decent i had a good curveball you know as a pitcher so it worked out that's awesome yeah what how fast can you throw your uh what's your average what was your high what was your average you know in your prime tell me i was about 66 i could throw uh, about 66 consistently oh no man i was 
I was popping 88 consistently. Yeah. I could probably pop a 90 here and there, but like yeah. consistently throughout the game, 86. I I threw the other day on a speed speed gun and I hit 86 still. So oh. it's still there. Um, yeah, you got it. If I was throwing more often, I'd probably pop 88 again. Yeah. Yeah. If you were to like get that arm going again, you know, and just like uh, work <laughs> yeah, it I'm out. I'm trying dude. not to hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love baseball. Yeah, that's my game. I play first base. I love to hit. My coach was always like, you're playing fourth on the list. And uh, we had a bat. It was called, uh, we love the natural. I don't know if you ever remember that movie, but, uh, you know, one the bat, best, man. One, yeah. the whole, everything you can think of. Baseball to me is exactly like America, you know, like I just love it so yeah, much. No. Like, the, Bo Jackson's my favorite baseball player. Just want you to know that, that anybody that can splinter a bat over their head. <laughs> it's not easy even if yeah, it's fractured of, uh, it's not easy <laughs> yeah there's a lot of beautiful nuances of baseball that most people will never understand because they don't give it enough time or, or they haven't played it enough yeah but the game of baseball has definitely uh kind of paved my 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 life ever since you know so i've been continued to uh reap the benefits of uh, a long life of playing baseball you know i just saw the jackie robinson story uh, with, uh, have you seen that yet? Yeah. The new yeah, one I've seen with Harrison probably Ford. Anything baseball I've seen it. I want to yeah. say that's probably my favorite Harrison Ford movie. Okay. And I, I, he just the baseball love that he had in that game. I'm just going to say baseball is, is a love of mine. And, uh, you know, wow. I, I love that you love baseball because don't you do something, um, on the side with a charity for your baseball? Don't you have like a hero sports foundation? Yeah. Tell me about yeah, exactly. I have a, have a nonprofit called Hero Sports. Uh, Mike Barker is the founder of it. Me and him came in together really early on to try and, you know, put some life into it. Uh, we play baseball and softball mainly yeah. uh, with veterans. We have, I think we have five teams now here in Utah. We have a countless amount of teams in San Antonio and across the nation. We have teams all over the place. Uh, you know, it's really just giving uh, veterans another another way of getting out and in, in, into the community and, and hanging out together and, and kind of keeping that camaraderie alive. And so we chose baseball and, and softball and, you know, what most people probably don't understand the game. It's not an easy game, right? It's a challenge. And I think the beautiful part about playing that sport is, is building that resilience in people and understanding like it takes work. Like, like, you know, if we can get into the weeds a little further, you know, I, you know, I, I try and push veterans to, to work, do the work, right. They need to make the efforts. And so if you want to get good at hitting, you got to go do the work. You got to hit the cages. Yeah. You got to learn a little bit about yourself. And so uh, I think that, the sport itself has so much value uh, and, and kind of can trans- transcend into the real life uh, events, you know, of, of it's true. You know, dusting yourself off and getting back up to the plate. And yeah. And so, you know, I love the game uh, and hero sports is a, is one of our, my nonprofits that, that, you know, we continue to advocate for veterans. Oh, a hundred percent. No, I, I follow you. You have a very heavy social media presence. Um, you know, you're on Instagram. I see you trending on TikTok. You're popping up in my FYP page. So I know you're out there. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, and I was like, you know, I need to get Vince on the show. That's exactly what it is. So I just want to, you know, uh, put your message out there because every time I see something, you're either carving pump- pumpkins as a wholesome dude. Okay. Trying to find that way in life as, as a family man. You're either sitting on a park bench talking to a dad about like, what's your struggles with like, you know, dadhood. Okay. Uh, you're out here trying to make veterans see themselves in a mirror so that they can understand that, you know, yeah. they're the, they're themselves. Like, let's focus on you. And, uh, you're just, yeah. you're, you're pushing the needle in every direction. And, and, and I can't say to, I can't help but say I'm honored to have you on the show and that you're also a huge actor. Right. I mean, you walk the red <laughs> carpets, <laughs> you yeah. know, I've seen, I've seen it. Uh, you know, you, you, you play with William Shatner in, uh, range 15, yeah. that movie that I first met you at up at Sundance years ago. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, to, to start years, right? with the man himself, the Trekkie, right. That makes you like, <laughs> A Trekkie. Do you ever get that connection? Do you go to Comic Con and someone's like, "Hey, I know you do all these things, but Shatner." <laughs> no, man. There's not a lot of people like I think the veteran community has seen Range 15 for the most part, right? But outside of that, or if you're connected to the veteran community at some point, right, in some some sort right. of fashion, but Range 15 is almost like a cult classic, right? It, it resonates with our little group of people during that time more than anything. If you were part of sure. social media and you kind of saw the whole thing kind of evolve, you know, Range 15. It's kind of a message, right? It's kind of like this really cool, like 
the movie itself is a movie, right? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it is what it is, right? I don't even know how to explain that. It's a cult classic. It's nothing crazy, nothing fancy the fast. Story behind how we did it and what we did. Yeah. yeah. What we did was just kind of beautiful. Yeah. And so try to find range 15, but then that transitions you Rocco into like doing other video projects. And I was seeing you more and more with like flamethrowers and I'm seeing you more and more with like, you know, rapping on the side of a, of a little bird, you know, with Matt best uh, doing a, I think it's bitch. I operate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. man. And that's so, kind of like, you know, that's really the beginning of it all for me really was, was working with Matt and JT. Right. You get in front of the camera and, and you're just a natural, you know, like right now talking with you. Uh, <laughs> so we can see why you've uh, climbed that ladder as well as you have all of these other ones that you attack in your life. You know, um, I, I'd say congratulations on just being who you are, you know, and uh, just mm-hmm. keep doing what you're doing. What's the hardest thing? that you're finding right now trying to juggle all of this? Is it a lot of the DMs coming in? Everybody's like, hey, how do I get in your TV series? Hey, how do I get a book written? What are you, what are you struggling with? Uh, I have a lot of people that want me on their podcast. Like, you know what I mean? I know yeah. you, Rad. So I was like, yeah, dude, I'll respond for sure. You know what I mean? But there's a lot of people that ask for my time, you know, and, and I'm very stingy with that intentionally, you know? Yeah. Um, I want to jump on everyone's podcast, but at the same time, like if their podcast films at night, that's probably not going to happen because that's my family time. Right? I'm very, I'm very intentional about how I spend my time with my family more than anything. Uh, I kind of put them in the front of everything, and and it, I think it's important for my life. Not everyone sees it that way, uh, and so if for some reason someone wants to kind of invade, you know, invade that space, it, it better be beneficial for for all parties involved, meaning my kids, my wife, and myself which means it has to be early in the morning where I can actually get on here and do it without no interruptions, you know? And so, Mm -hmm. you know, that's why I told you, I was like, what works best for me is early morning because after that I have meetings, I have a couple of writing tasks I need to get done for, for my personal uh, stuff that I'm working on another book and some scripts, you know? And so like, Mm -hmm. you know, my life is continual growth, but as well as continual development. And as I'm developing, that means it takes time. And anytime I step away from that development, it it just kind of, to me in my head, it, it takes away from my family. And so um, it's a hard choice to say, yeah, let me take time out of my day to give someone else my time. Uh, and so it has to it has to align really well. And so I get a, I, I try and do a lot of podcasts because I just want to give back to the people. I just want to give my time to others. I want to I want to spread my, my message to others. But at the same time, uh, it, it becomes very time consuming to, to do these over and over and over again. And so I just try and spread them out. But, yeah, that's probably the, the hardest thing is is time management. Yeah. And and thank you for uh, choosing to be on the show. And I appreciate that. I really do. I mean, uh, when you're doing time management, so coming from my father's background, he was an SF Green Beret, right? And I'd always go to his office and I'd see on the back of his wall, a big whiteboard all the time. And it was not just for today's mission. It was for like two years mission, you know, for those of us out there that are listening, that are hearing, are you, is there anything like that that you're using as a template? Are you looking further than six months out in your life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was just t- talking to my daughter about this, about setting goals and, and achieving them. And, you know, in the military, we, you know, in the army, we shoot, you know, 50 meter targets all the way out to, I think it's 25 meter targets and all the way out to 300 meters. It's been a while now. Um, and so I always talk about that 50 meter target, you know, what, like what's the first initial threat, right? What is, what is the immediate concern? Uh, and and what what can I accomplish now? And then what is going to hopefully build and turn into something later in the future? And so my my, my thought process in in success and as I'm continuing to grow, I think that the ten ten years, I think twenty years ahead, I think about yeah. um, you know sustaining this lifestyle for a long time and what does that look like? You know, I I knew that so like the whole you know Matt and JT and us doing YouTube videos, I I kind of felt that there was an expiration date on that. I wasn't sure. I just felt like there was right, and so. Initially, I started doing theater classes again. I did some in college, but I started thinking about it. I started studying it again because I thought like, well, what's the long game? If you start at YouTube, maybe I can transition into film in Hollywood, right? And it ended up happening that way, right? It ended up, you know, and, and part of me, part of me, one, thought of it, but two, started preparing for that, you know? And and so same as now, it's like, okay, I got into Hollywood. Cool, I'm acting. But what's what's that, you know, that's now my, my 50 meter shot, but what's my mm-hmm. 300 meter shot now? And 
for me, it was getting into writing, right? And to, to, to getting into a position in Hollywood where I was considered a Hollywood writer, right? And so that's happening now as we speak. And so what's the, so now that that's the 50 meter, you know, target for me, what's the, what's that 300 meter? And now to me, it's to creating a television show, to be a show creator in Hollywood, right? And to, to continue to push that needle and to continue to, to evolve as a human, right? And, but in, 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 in that same umbrella, I'm doing that with making sure I'm keeping the, the family at the forefront of it, right? What's not going to take time from the family too much? What, you know, yeah, I wrote a book the other, you know, in the past six months ago, I've been writing a book. I, I don't, I'll be able to talk about that more when I get the thumbs up on it. But, you know, I was having to manage being kind of a, not a stay at home dad, but like, you know, stay at home parents. We, we were, you know, I did, I did my job as mine. I put, put my money away and I, and I did my, you know, my finances mm-hmm. in a way where I could be home. I didn't have to go chase the next project, but, but the next project was writing. And so that's cool. I did it in my office. And so I was able to manage a lot of time with family, driving them to school, picking them up, coaching football, you know, spending time with my wife, going to lunch, breakfast, whatever the case. Right. But I did that intentionally because I know that my is coming back. And when my comes back, it's kind of like gives it, it kind of takes my energy. It takes a lot of my, my focus. And so uh, at that point, my family kind of takes a back seat, which is not easy for me to do because it, it's kind of intimidating to do that. So these are what I, that's what I manage. I manage my time in a way where, where I try and think about the long game and what's going to, what's going to slowly, what can I do now that will inadvertently lead into a better direction? And so I start working on that now. So I'll explain that I became a writer in Hollywood, right? That's all going to become out one of these days in some kind of blog or some crap, right? Right. But that only happened because I took a year to focus on uh, the Veterans Writing Guild uh, writing project, right? I graduated from that program and that led me to another option, right? And so, so like that was my, my 50 meter shot at that time was that class. I was still filming season four of mine, but I was also going through this program. I've been going through the program for over a year before the, before the, you know, and, but I knew like, I, this is what I need to do now and accomplishing this will get me into the next stage. And it did. And, you know, and like, and I, and I continue to think like that. And so now writing this book, I just wrote 80,000, word book right which is uh, which very chunky like solid yeah. book well i'm hoping that that book will lead me into the next room that'll help me create a television show like that's genuinely what i'm trying to manifest but I, i'm not just thinking it i'm actually doing it i'm putting actions to paper literally yeah. mm-hmm. and so that's how i do it and so once that book comes out i'll already be pitching that project to major production companies and hoping they pick up my story so i can turn around and be a now a show creator in hollywood and then I've already done all the work behind it, right? I've already shown the acting. I've already done the writing. I've already done, mm-hmm. you know, and so that's kind of how I vision my life and I continue to do so. And so, I, I mean, that's like a long winded question, but the truth is like, I try and find success in act, well, in the entertainment space. And if that's an umbrella, then acting falls in that, directing falls in that, producing falls in that, writing oh, yeah, falls everything. in that, mm-hmm. right? And so, right. And so in that mindset, I can potentially bring money into the household like to keep the lights on, right? Cause that's always the number one concern. I can keep the lights on in any one of those avenues, which right. relieves a lot of stress for me because then that means I don't have to just be great at one. I just have to be good at a few. <laughs> right. Right. And it's fortunate to get paid in Hollywood, uh, uh, you know, to work on a project and to have been cast in a project, you know, I mean, so many of us actors have become professional rejectionists, right? We go into an audition, we yeah. give ourselves up and it's like, here we are as a vulnerable person trying to give you what we think you want in this scene, uh, for just like a moment in an audition to be like, never heard from again. What happened with that? Yeah. You know, the psychological benefit yeah. of, I've got to do this again and I've got to go do this again because I believe I, in myself. I was just writing about this dude. It is, it, I guess, like I said before, baseball, has continued to transcend and give me life life lessons that I use today. It's like ha- hitting a baseball, right? It's so hard, but <laughs> doing an audition and getting denied every time is just as hard, if not harder, right? Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's it's. I, I don't even know what to say. I, I, you got to know it. If, you know, right. if you're if you're going out and auditioning, yeah, you know I mean, what it's like. Yeah, it is. It's heartbreaking because you're like, oh, man, I have an audition for this huge show. It's going to be a great opportunity. And you start thinking like, hell, yeah, man, if I get this, it's going to be life changing. It's going to be great. And then you go out there and do the audition. You hear nothing back. You're like, damn, that sucks. Right. Like, what a burn. And I suck. You know, uh, it's pretty much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. You, you, doubt, you do. all those things. The in, in, insecurities pop up. You think, like, what am I even doing here? Maybe I should go find a new career field. I've done that multiple times. I've reapplied for federal positions. Right. So many times, bro, right. because I start to doubt again and I right. try not to let that linger in my head too long. But, you know, the thought process is like, 
can I continue to to do this? And, and financially, will this continue to be a benefit, right? And it's, dude, it's hard to say. Uh, I believe I'm putting in the work to try and make sure one of those spaces of payment, right, would work. Yeah. But man, there's there's plenty of people that will never get a job again after mines is done, whenever that is, right? Like we, you just don't know. And so that, that, uh, that uncertainty definitely weighs heavy. Yeah, it's like Tom Cruise, as, a, as an example, doesn't have to work monetarily. He has so much money uh, uh, set aside. He chooses the craft to chase it, to always be acting. You know, there's just something about the yeah. camera, the set, you know, oh, let's take 10, go get craft services. You know, that whole thing, like, you know, the flying Hawaiian pulls up with your mahi mahi ready to go, dude. It's true. Like this happens, right? And you have your star yeah. wagons trailer. So having a taste of that uh, can always just keep you going. And again, you know, I'm always auditioning and chasing it. And uh, I just think it's awesome to be. Well, Red, think about this, yeah. man. Tell me. Thank you. No, well, thank you for that compliment. But yeah. it's crazy to me that, you know, it's all about opportunity, luck, and 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 it really is it's like opportunity and luck, right? Like if they write the perfect script and they're looking for the perfect guy and you're lucky enough to audition for that and the producer sees you and they give you a chance, right? They give you a fucking chance. That's all you need. Correct. And that one chance can change your life forever, right? Forever. Like imagine if you landed, bro, if you landed freaking the next Harry Potter and you're freaking, you know, one of the dudes – that would be life changing financially Correct, yeah. and, 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 you know, and as well as creatively, it would change your life forever. And what puts you in position to do that? I have no idea. There is no algorithm for this, right? Like for acting, it is right place, right time, right opportunity and being prepared right. for it. Right. And it's, it's this, it's, it is a lottery ticket of lottery tickets, bro. And so like for the fact that I'm, look, there was a lot of combat veterans in Hollywood trying to be actors before me. And somehow I kind of jumped levels and got there before them. It's unfair. It's it's the weird thing about life that it's, like life is not fair. And and you know, I've tried to do the most with it in the respect to like I respect them and I respect the craft and so I'm going to try and do as much as I can with that opportunity. As you should and and take advantage of learning on set and understanding what 4K and 2K and stinger cables are and just like, you know, stand to the side and, you know, uh, knowing that that's a grip and that's the gaff and that's the, you know, these are combo stands. You know, I say like, if you're trying to get into film, try to find something local in your area where they're, they're trying to practice their craft in like an acting class or a, uh, a film class. It's okay to pay the dues like a gym and get in there because everybody in there is vulnerable at acting classes. They're there to work on their yeah. craft. Um, yeah, and, and just get better at it. And then they're putting movies together. And then you might be able to say, Hey, do you need help on that Saturday? And like, yeah, can you come hold the combo stand? What is that? Well, come on, come on out and we'll show you what that is. Right. And then the next thing you know, yeah. you're more professional on the next set and then more professional on the next step. And then you're like, you know, yeah. Uh, then you're holding the sticks yeah, for I the mean, camera. I, I tell people, right. Or you're producing your own films, right? Like right. I tell people all the time, like we're in a very, fortunate time where you can actually you want to show the world you can act you want to show them how fucking good you are film it produce that right. shit like let them see because we we don't have to sit around and wait for someone to bring you on board to make a movie we can do it ourselves now our cell phones make 4k right yeah, all those veterans out there that want to be actors yeah yeah exactly so we are. all those veterans yeah. and all the anyone who anyone who wants to be an actor Fucking do it, man. Show the world you can do that. Because as soon as you show them you have a skill set that like you can't turn your head from, you're going to get jobs. I believe in that. I fully believe. You know, there's this whole thing in Hollywood right now, but I, and I don't want to take us too far off, but whole thing in Hollywood right now, right, where we're, you know, Hispanics are being uh, appropriated or whatever uh, by, by people who are not Hispanic and, and actors should be getting more opportunity. Like, okay, I understand the argument, but to me, it's like, why, why not just be one of the dopest actors ever where people can't turn away from you and right. that gets you opportunity not just the color of your skin or your culture or whatever the case to me i believe the best man should win right I, i've always been a competitive person i was like so if i'm auditioning for a role and you're auditioning for a role and my color matches the skin of the actual character who gives a shit can i do it can i pull it off i don't well, i don't know i want to show up and be the best that there ever was and people to not be able to ignore the skills that i provide and if i can do that well then i'm good at my craft and if I can't, I better get better. <laughs> That's how yeah, I see really. it. Yeah, really. 
you know, that's like some Michael Caine advice right there. You know, uh, he was uh, in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Michael Caine, huge actor. Uh, one time he was on set with Dustin Hoffman and Dustin Hoffman was like up for the whole 24 hours prior to the filming. He wanted to be really worn out, really tired for his scene. He was supposed to be up all haggard. And Michael Caine said, that's awesome. But have you ever thought about acting? <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man. <laughs> you know, Love like, it. what are you doing, bro? You could just be tired, yeah. right? Or <laughs> like, but you got method versus non-method acting, you know? So it's like. Yeah. Uh, everyone has their process, right? Everyone has their style. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I'm just being sent out as now I'm the Viking going out for Viking roles or like this cowboy show that just came out here. I uh, can't talk about it because I signed on to the audition, but all these different things. That, that was a crazy <laughs> audition. I hadn't ever had to sign onto an audition where I couldn't talk about nothing with the audition that was interesting yeah there's a there's a there's, there's a lot of that it just de- depends on the level echelon of of the audition so it was you know, it happens all the time there's some it was heavy level <laughs> there's somebody you have to sign the, yeah, yeah yeah i know exactly what you're talking about because i live here but yeah. the crazy thing is that uh I, i've signed ndas before they even send me the sides mm-hmm. you know you're like oh okay <laughs> Right. And then they send you sides. You're like, isn't this from like Pulp Fiction? <laughs> They're just sending you sides. They're like, do this scene from True Romance. You're like, am I Tony Soprano? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so now that you have acting in your life and that's helping to, you know, move you in that direction, do you find that uh, being military has helped you to transition into the life of, you know, um, of a chain of command on set and, uh, you know, how that works. Do you, do you implement that? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities between military and film, like in, in a film crew, um, you know, everyone has a job to do, right. There's an overall mission. That mission is the script. Uh, and you know, you get your grunts on the ground, uh, who are, who are the, the actors on set who have to know their jobs and they have to, they have to essentially accomplish the mission that's set for that day. And then you have all the support staff who's working all around you, right? Who's, who's putting the lights on, who's, who's holding the camera, who's doing the makeup, you know? And so it's very similar, uh, you know, very parallel lives, if you will. I show up early, I'm prepared, you know, I, I've done my training, right? Training just like you would in any other thing. Uh, and, and, you know, you have to understand the hierarchy and, and who to say yes, sir, yes, ma'am, uh, absolutely. And how that works, right? It's like the platoon's you know, the PL of the platoon is trying to tell you like, Hey, I think we need to enter the house this way because it's probably safer or whatever the case. And you're like, okay, Roger that director. I, I, I'll do exactly as you say, right. I'm gonna do it my way, but I'm gonna do exactly what you say. Right. And mm-hmm. so yeah, the parallels is, is ridiculous. And, you know, I think more veterans should a- attempt the theater arts because there's more than just a job that you kind of feel that like you could kind of fit right into and understand, but you could also find therapeutic value in theater, right? That's, I think that's what I do more than anything. I find a lot of therapeutic value in being able to create these emotions that most likely, you know, I haven't been allowed to, or, or hasn't been socially acceptable in, in this alpha male freaking, you know, special operations community. I've been able to do right. that. I've been able to transcend past that. I've been able to just be able to like, yeah, I'm an actor. Give a fuck. I'll cry all I, all I need. And that's yeah. been healthy for me, you know, and I've been able to turn around and tell others to do the same. So, yeah, I think the military has helped me uh, immensely with my acting career. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. And then I think what what I would say with that is, you know, there is a total chain of command. And I think Spielberg even wears like a colonel on his hat, you know, when they were like doing Saving Private Ryan and everybody on his his team on the first unit and second unit all had like little rank and everybody was just rolling that way just for filming Save a Private Ryan because they're so engulfed in that, you know, that world right yeah. there. And so I think there's a photo of him wearing like a Colonel full bird on his hat. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? I get it. I get it. That's you know, cool. the chain of command, the order, right? It works. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with that, you, 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 you know, it's just so cool, man, with like, with acting and, and making, and making TV series, you're working with Kurt Sutter, right? Okay. The, right. Is that right? The creator of, Mines MC. Yeah, he, for the first two seasons. Yeah, he's the, he's the writer. He's a co-writer creator of the show. Okay. In the first two seasons, he was there, and then after that, uh, Elgin took over. Elgin. Okay. So, are these guys pulling from you, like on set, like, hey, yo, Rocco, let me come, Gilly, come over here. This is what we want to get out of you in this scene. Are they just, you know, are they really like pulling that out of you, bro, so that you can be like, hey, I, I'm here for you. What do you need from me? And they're like, we want you to do this. What, what's up? Are they? Yeah, on? you know. You know, every 
from from my experience, those two creators are very different on how they run a set, right? Um, you know, Kurt Kurt was Kurt was very stern. Kurt was like Sergeant Major. You know what I mean? He was very very strict and stern in how he wanted everything. You know, uh, Elgin's a little bit more laid back and relaxed. Elgin's a little bit more um, kind of like I felt like more like t- I say team player, but it kind of sounds bad. It's more like I felt more comfortable going to Elgin and saying, "Hey, here's how I feel about this." Um, I didn't feel comfortable doing that with Kurt when one, you know, the first two seasons I was very new. And so I was kind of mm-hmm. still, you know, you know, trying to get my feet wet, you know, so maybe it was more of a psychological thing when I was like, I don't want to go talk to the big dog because I don't want to get freaking yelled at You're right, in the military mindset. Right. But uh, by the time I got to season three, I was definitely uh, kind of more broken in and it felt like I understood how it all worked out and how the layout goes. And so when I got a line that I wasn't sure like what the delivery would look like, I'd actually go up to him and say, Hey, uh, is this line delivered like angry or is this le- is delivered, you know, more subtle? Like, what what are you looking for in this? And what are you, what are you trying to accomplish right with Gilly? And so he'd tell me, man. And then, you know, we went deeper into, he wanted to develop my character to be a veteran, right? He wanted him to, mm-hmm. to kind of go through the, you know, through the, uh, the post-traumatic stress kind of like cycle, you know, he wanted to see it on film. And so I, I did help with writing some of my concepts and giving them to him. And he was able to put them onto the script and, and, and make what we had for season three and season four. So yeah, there was a lot of teamwork when it comes with Elgin. I think, you know, Kurt's been creating for so long. He's a genius. Everyone knows how, how much of a genius he is. Mm-hmm. I think he has his way of doing things that he likes and he kind of keeps it that way. And, you know, I guess like expectations said, there's, there's no and- right or wrong answer probably want to just like always yeah. please Kurt you know I'd imagine it's just like okay I know my lines yeah I'm here I'm here to fix whatever you need and then here's my bill and I'm out you know it's like professionalism straight up yeah. he probably brings you on and says I expect yeah. have expectations and I'm sure every director does and everybody's going to be a little bit unique with their talent but you know they all want you to get the job done it. everyone's yeah. slightly right they all know what they, they all have a mission to do and they all want to accomplish that mission in, in, in their way that they feel is, they, they feel would be the best and so yeah, I'm just uh, I, I can just I feel a little bit more comfortable in my in my position now with minds, and so I'm I'm able to ask more questions, and I feel like I'm 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 stepping on toes. <laughs> right, and so and so and so working with uh, is it JD Pardy? Is that JD? Is that right? Is that JD uh, Pardo? Yeah. Pardo, yeah. What's that That's experience been like? Yeah, huh? Let's let's easy. <laughs> it, I mean, working with all of them is valuable, right? They they're all my teachers i've been able to pull from all of them and see how they get into character and how they you know you read the words on the paper and then you see them come to life out of them and you're like whoa i didn't think about that way of doing it right and i didn't see it i didn't see those words coming out with that expression and so it's just beautiful to watch how everyone does their thing i think jd is one of the most technical and trained actors i have ever worked with i think he understands acting at a very like man visceral level you know he he can explain to you why to do certain things at certain times and why it's important for edits and why to stand a certain way during the camera like he understands it's so profound it's it's fucking rad you know and then you got guys like michael irby who plays bishop right he's the he, he plays bishop on the show michael irby has been doing this for so long he's got this professionalism about him that is like Oh man, I, I just find that dude to be the most intriguing person to watch on set because I think he has so many levels of mm-hmm. of character that he brings to the table, and he has shown me so much of like, fuck it, do it, just go with it, right? And it's just beautiful. And then you got guys like you got Emilio, who's like a legend, right? With the whole Sons of Anarchy legend, legend uh, continues to roll into Mayans, you know, who is who's like a father figure to me he's just a great person like i don't know i've learned from everyone coco like richard ramirez dude yeah right i think i've learned probably more from him than anyone because i've worked with him so much you know i've been able to go toe-to-toe with him on a scene and 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 to know his background and where he came from and his traumas to know that we both struggled with traumas in our own likeness and be able to come to set and be able to like butt heads with 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 acting it's just i don't know i can't i can't think this whole opportunity enough for giving me so much education on acting and, and being like, uh, you know, I feel like I have a master's in this now because working with some of these greats. Yeah. And, and being on actual film sets and, you know, the talk and everything going back and forth, it just is going to season you more and just make you even more ready for that big production that you're about to do. I, I just totally am pulling for you on all, on all fronts. Uh, 
<clears throat> I love how you're vulnerable with putting yourself out there on social media. Uh, you talk about things that are sensitive to someone with knuckle tattoos. <laughs> you wouldn't think some guy <laughs> so hard charging would be like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stressed out today, but, uh, following your TikTok and seeing how personable you are, um, it's real easy to kind of just realize, yeah. Hey, you know, uh, we all go through these same types of things in life. You know, you just, you're just really an yeah, open yeah. book. Yeah. Oh cool. yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's very unhealthy to keep that stuff in. It's very yeah. unhealthy just to allow it to, to stack up and stack up and then explode in some way. Uh, you know, I think I used to, you know, I'm sober, right? Three years go ongoing. Congratulations. And, um, it's going to be, it'll be four years in March. And so thank you. Uh, you know, the funny thing about it is like alcohol was my answer to trying to you know, block everything that was stressing me out, right? Alcohol was the answer. The military taught me that. Shit, my dad taught me that, right? It's just what we did. One, you know, if you're in a Hispanic culture, there's a thing called machismo, right? We can't show weakness, right? That's like men don't do that in our culture, right? And then you get into the special operations communities, like you don't show weakness there either. And so, you know, my whole life, I've I've never really shown, I've never been this like um, emotional spectrum of from, from emotional to angry. I've just kind of been like middle ground and straight to angry, you know, and that wasn't healthy either. You know, I found myself getting into fights a lot. I found myself just willing to try and throw down with people just for the fact that like you made me uncomfortable, <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And so uh, as I've grown and as I've gotten older and I've, I've, I've done some deep diving, you know, I realized like, you know, the, those are all insecurities, right? Those are insecurities and, and not willing to just be open and honest and be human um, can be detrimental, you know, especially to our, to our, you know, to the men out there who are afraid to be honest and open <clears throat> and real. Like if you're not open and honest and real with your emotions, there's somehow it's going to spew out of you. It's going to be ugly, negative. It's going to be probably through drinking. It's going to be fighting. It's going to be unhealthy relationships is going to be through what, oh, gaining too much weight is going to be, it's going to be somewhere, right? You're, you're, you're all that stuff finds its way out of your system in some aspect. Uh, and so I refuse to be, um, I refuse to be held down by this, by this ideology of, I had to be tough. And for me to one, learn acting, I had to be able to open up those doors and two, Combat did something to me, dude. It's just the truth. Combat did something to me. I'm not. There's guys who've seen worse and done more, right? Mm -hmm. Facts. But I know for a fact that combat changed things in me that make me more susceptible to emotions. I can empathize with people more now than ever. I understand pain. I understand loss. I understand fear. I've seen it on people's fucking eyes, dude. I've seen it because I created it for them. I've been that guy, right? I've been the guy that kicks in the door yeah. and they're terrified for the life. And it haunts me, dude. To, it's not like I was, I'm doing my job. I don't feel bad for, about doing our job overseas. There's, there's just what it is. But I can also be this other person and say, yo, right. that didn't feel good for them. I know what no. it felt like for them. And if that happened to me, I'd feel the same, right? And right. so- Somehow I'm almost like two people were like, I know there's the, the, there's the lover and then there's the fighter overseas. You're the fighter, but there's the heart of me goes, Ooh, that one, that one's going to stick for a minute. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I've been, I, I found my own healing has been in, in my own story is just saying it like it is, man. Like why, why bullshit, man? There's so many people out there that are bullshitting <laughs> the world yeah. because they're too afraid to face themselves dog right, right? you know what i mean like look That's we live true. in the land of utah there's like more life coaches that you've ever seen in your entire <laughs> life and 90 percent of them have done very little in life to be able right. to give someone else you know Any lessons advice. i find it very strange to me yeah I, I just find it i just find it odd because most of those dudes hide behind money that that you eventually find out they don't really have right they're just they're on credit right and they hide behind these fancy cars and big houses and and fake relationships but like the truth is dude like none of that is happiness dog like no. it, when you go to combat and you see poverty right and you see these people wake up with nothing and they're still just as happy like you realize real fast money is not the root of happiness right money can cause a lot of issues money is a root of comfort like i can say that like money makes my life comfortable right. but if i am so disillusioned to think that money is happiness bro you will chase that fucking carrot forever and never be fully happy with yourself. 
Right. And so I refuse to do that. I refuse. I, I want to be honest. I want to be open. I want to be for my kids sake. Like, I think everything I've done, like I, I, I said this before to somebody, but like the residual effects of loving my family and trying to be better for them has been the success that you see. All that success is not what I was chasing. I'm just chasing how can I show that I can do more and be better for them? How can I right. be a good example for my kids to say, there is like, like my son says, dad, I want to be this. Well, do it. There's nothing stopping you. Like, nothing, let me yeah. show you that. I'm going to prove exactly. to you. Like I grew, I grew up dyslexic, bro. I had a fifth grade reading level graduating high school. I've got, I've published multiple books. I, I write scripts and I speak publicly in front of thousands of people all the time. Right. I am telling you, I am not a smart man. I am not a supernatural person. I am human as fuck, dude. I Please. just am willing to put myself through the work. I am willing to just face it head on and say, I might fail. And that's okay. 100%. You know, and that bothers me that so many people are not afraid of being open and honest with themselves. So many people are hiding behind money and thinking that's, that's the answer. It's not, you're going to find yourself empty inside because that's all it is. Those are insecurities. When I see people like, Oh, those are insecurities. They're, 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 they're paying for their insecurities and trying to cover them up. It's no different than alcohol and drugs, right? It, yeah. It's the same thing. It's a different addiction. Let me boost my own ego by showing you how cool I am. Like, Okay, if that's what you need, fine, right? I'm not, and I'm not saying if you have the money to buy nice shit, go for it, dude. Go for it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Dumb like, money. That's what I call cool, it. I was like, if you got dumb money, do get, it. But if you're yeah, driving like a, a $90,000 Platinum Ford and you're like, I'm looking at you like that car payment is like, how much is that car payment? I'm like, that's what I'm thinking, you know? And then I think, wow, I wonder what <laughs> they're doing. I'm just like. <laughs> I don't find that smart. I don't no, know. The insurance. It's, so the insurance, for me. Yeah. <laughs> Family is what right. makes me I'm rich. Say for right? me, look, I, <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. My That's relationship, it. my family, the, the coaching my spend. son, right? Coaching That's my right. daughters, uh, golfing with you my said, other son. Like everyone has a thing. You schedule uh, your your time with your family priority, right? Because that's that you yeah. want them to say, hey, dad, I'm home. Or, hey, dad, yeah. can you help me? Or, okay, no. dad, well, I'm here, but I'm downstairs on the phone. And you're like, well, I'm available. You know? Time is it's money, like, bro. Yes, time, exactly. Time is money. And when they say time <laughs> is money, yeah, the most valuable thing you have is that. And the most valuable yeah. thing you can spend your time on is your loved ones. Your exactly. inner circle loved ones. Not like your homies. Like your homies, yeah, you'll find time. They're for always, them, but yes. Your kids and your wife, they, yeah, your kids and your wife need need more of you than ever. Core and, memories is what we know, call it in, in our household. Well. Yeah, it's like, you know, we're like... What is it? With core memories. So my wife and I, we like to go yeah. see rock concerts together because we we talk about that seven, ten months later. We're still... Do you remember that concert and like Metallica? Yeah, no, sure. And like, you know, it's like these core memories of like going to the pumpkin patches and taking your kids and, you know, even if right. they're in their... Tw- my kids are in their 20s, right? I got a 20-year-old now. I got a 17-year-old now. And I got a 14-year-old now. And so it's like, you know, that time is fleeting, you know? And so yes. it's 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 time to still go to the pumpkin patches with your 20-year-old and be the dad and, you know, have that yeah. time with your wife. If, if you still have that capability to do so, that's just my advice yeah. of 21 years of marriage. Uh, I, I agree, dude. <laughs> I, I agree. It's nurturing that relationship, right? Nurturing right. that family. Like, I think... I don't know. Look, this is just me. This is my opinion on this shit. Like I drive a Toyota Camry because it's good on gas and the motherfuckers <laughs> paid off. Right. What's up? Yeah. Like, I'm good. I yeah, got Toyota Scion, dude. Need, I don't need <laughs> Yeah. There's nothing more I need really. Like, I, you know, when you think of concepts of cars, like, okay, the car's paid off. The car works. I'm yep. winning, dude. I'm good. Cause all I need to do is get from point A to point B and get, and it needs to do that. Well, let's it does car that, payment. So I'm happy. Yep. Right. Yep. And, Right. You know, but I, I try and see it that way because I wasn't always that way. I was always, I used to be financially inept. I used to be a fool. I used to just spend everything I had because I'm Frivolous. like, oh, enjoy your mm-hmm. money. Right. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. And mm-hmm. it was just ridiculous because then it comes taxes. You're like, oh crap, I owe a lot of taxes. And then you go, yeah. oh man, now I'm, now I'm working paycheck to paycheck again. Right. Like, like I've made those mistakes and I'm going to tell people like real fast, you're going to see if you think that's what happiness is, it'll come back. Right. Like, that debt will get paid. You owe your time to your family. You know, you're either going to learn that very late when it's too late or you're going to learn it early, you know, and you're going to appreciate. And so, I mean, look, if family's important to you or the relationships you've built, your wife, your kids, your, what, you'll eventually learn that we've made a lot of choices in our lives and it didn't put us in the position to be better parents and sons and fathers, right? Like whatever the case 
you know, I had to, I had to fight that a long time ago when I was doing law enforcement and I had to, f- and I was, it was like law enforcement, then hanging out with the boys, drinking beers, blah, 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 blah. I was adding all these things to my plate, but like my family was getting the seconds and that's not fair, dude. Right. But again, this is me learning it. I've learned it. I've been there, done that. And so now I won't do that again. And, you know, and I get a lot of calls from people that go, Hey bro, how do I fix this? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah. I, I try to warn you. I yeah. try to warn you. It, it's just the truth of the matter, man. Like, if family is important to you, then then they should be the they should be the primary thought process of how you how you make choices in life. And there's sometimes okay. you can't, right? Sometimes you you everybody has to work, and everybody, you know, like my parents, they both work, dude. They're both, you know, they were building something for me that I have now today, right? They, what they've built is they, they started off exactly. My, they started my life off in a good space, and so that that's a thing. But there's those people that choose to work over choose work over relationships and the hard part about that is is that they will find themselves alone and they're going to say man i make plenty of money but this house is empty and my relationships are empty because i didn't nurture any of them it's like you know this 40 year old who's just focused so hard on their on their on their corner office and just and now they're 40 and they're like oh i have all this money but what do i who do i share it with or how do i who do i leave this to uh Who's, what's the foundation yeah. that I've built? And sometimes it's a little late at that point, you know? I mean, a friend of mine just had a kid at 45. Bro, I have a story. <laughs> you know? Oh, just, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. I, mean, yeah. I know what he's feeling. I was I was 40 when I had my last one. I'm like, oh, God. So he just threw 45. He's no, 45. I'll you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll tell you a story, man. I was on an airplane, and it was like a four-hour flight, and I'm sitting next to this dude who's obviously a businessman, right? He's not in the greatest shape of his life. He's just a, kind of a business. You can tell he sits behind a desk all day. And he's like, you know, and we got into just simple conversation. He goes, what do you do for a living, man? And I was like, uh, you know, at the time I was special operations for the border patrol. Right. And so I said, I work for Homeland Security and I, you know, I'm on the special operations. I'm a, I'm a search trauma man. I'm a pretty much a search trauma medic. Right. That's what that's what I'm, a, I'm a search and rescue medic. And I'm also on the tactical side of things. Right. So I kind of explained and broke that down. He's just like, oh, man. Yeah, that's exciting, dude. He goes, man, I sometimes I wish my life was that exciting. And I'm like, yeah, what do you do? He goes, nothing. I, uh, you know, I, I sit in a cubicle. I work nine to five. I, I take my kids to work and I have dinner with them every night, but yeah, it's not as exciting as you. I'm like, and I'm looking at him like, bro, that is a beautiful life. I would love to take my kids to school every fucking day. I would love to have dinner with my kids every damn night. I just don't have that lifestyle. I chose something completely different. Now, both jobs are probably necessary, right? Whatever he's doing is necessary for his family or for whatever he's doing. And for what I'm doing is necessary for my family. I don't know if I could actually work in a cubicle. I just don't know if I, my mind can handle that. It's just something I've never really done. I've been this very active person, right? but he envied my life because it was so exciting. And I envied his cause it was so damn perfect. It was so damn basic, like kids, dinner, boom. And you know, it's, you say like the grass is always greener, right? But I easily could have quit my job and found a different job. I just didn't, I wasn't willing to, right. I wasn't willing to sacrifice, you know, that. And if I put my family first, uh, that would have been I would have probably chose a different job at the time. I wasn't putting my family first. So I'm sitting in this big old house, uh, you know, and, and alone and no time with my kids. And so I kind of pivoted from that day, you know, from that is when I started to adjust my, my, my career field. I ended up walking away from the border patrol because I wanted more time with them. Mm -hmm. But as things get busier in Hollywood, I find myself getting busy again. And so now I'm back in this kind of like the cycle of like, don't do it again, asshole. Don't fucking do it again. So I have to uh, make sure I don't. Do you think that, uh, now that some, well, now you've got some wee ones, right? You got a couple young, young ones in your yeah. life, you know, some new, new kids, but some of your older kids, uh, they might understand dad now, right? They might have that understanding because they're also now chasing dreams and, uh, you know, moving that goal yeah. for their, you know, in their goalpost. So, um, you know, yeah. in the beginning it was hard because I'd get pulled away, um, doing my job here in, in Salt Lake with the war games and everything. Every weekend it was like, Oh, there's a baptism. Oh, well, Rad can't make it because he's got to go run war games. Oh, hey, this weekend there's a birthday party. Oh, yeah, well, I got to keep the war games going because, you know, the lights and the war game community got to keep going. Oh, yeah. this Saturday, this Saturday, that Saturday. And then it's like my Saturdays always superseded my wife's needs. <clears throat> and so she uh, let me do that and so uh, allowed the relationship to grow that way or else I wouldn't be here today. So, you know, just to... To, yeah. to su- the support of my wife and and my kids now that they're older but yeah i do kind of have some regrets you know it's like oh i missed the kids you know a birthday i was like 
literally out the door right. into a Humvee for war games because we had a Humvee all of a sudden. Yeah. It's like, I got to go. Happy birthday. Yeah, She's and, three. She won't miss that. And for- <laughs> I know, dude. I get it. Trust me, dude. I've missed births, right? Like I would tell anyone that has a lifestyle where they can't be there for every birthday. We have grown accustomed to no hard dates. And this Mm -hmm. might help some of you like figure that out. Like I've had to break my, my, my wife's mindset on you had to celebrate (laughs) that birthday on the exact day. I've had to break that mentality because her whole life has been that day, that day, that day. And I said, listen, we have no hard dates in this household. There's none. Because if you if you give yourself a hard date and say we have to celebrate that day, we're opening ourselves up for heartbreak. It's going to hurt. Yeah. All right. So now we kind of shift fire. We're like, okay, this is their birthday. We'll make sure we do this little cake and thing. But their right. birthday party is this day because we can all be there. Right. And so right. that has been the savior for for me not feeling guilty for missing spe- specific days, especially during the week. When I'm filming Monday through Friday, I'm gone. Saturday, yeah. Sunday, I fly home. I fly home Friday night. Saturday, Sunday, I'm home. Boom, I fly back for Monday. And so- that idea of no hard dates has really relieved a lot of pressure in me to say, I don't have to be there every single time. I could actually miss a little bit and then we'll, we'll re we'll re-engage that birthday, that Christmas, that, that whatever mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. And that has and, worked really well for us. And so some of you that are struggling to find that, you know, talk to the wife and, and try and negotiate that no hard dates. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like that. And, and, you know, we kind of do that as well here at my household. I have to say there are like, okay, this week we have two kids born in, the same week of October, and then my other daughter's October. So all the kids are October. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm broke. Okay, yeah. so October fourth quarter. <laughs> that's like it's yeah. a hard month. Well, my wife's birthday's in Chris is is December. Our anniversary's in December, and everybody's Christmas is in December. So I'm like, just take my blood. Oh, Here you man. go. But um, yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's totally true. You know, uh, the compromise aspect of the relationship of the kids and everybody's like, okay, we'll get together. We'll go do a staycation together and celebrate everybody together now that we're older. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, and I like Good. that the kids understand. That's it. super cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so many similarities. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I've had you, I've had your time. I know you, you, you said hard 10. And we're coming up on that time. So I just want to give you a couple, um, like a minute or two to shout out your Veterans HQ, if you wish, or what you got going on, Rocco. Yeah. Tell us. Uh, I mean, I got a ton of stuff. Just if you have any questions, hit me up on social media. You know what I mean? Like my goal, you know, Veteran, Veteran I started that a couple of years ago. And I tried to do, you know, the whole gimmick of like giving away a vehicle and it ran the company broke. It didn't work, right? Like you try and do these things because you think it's going to work and it didn't, right? No, the hopes was that if it did really well, we'd be able to put that money into building some very healthy transition centers for veterans, right? And so the the ideology was there, the business, you know, uh, the business model and everything was there. It's just, but at the same time we did that, the the market was oversaturated with all these giveaways, right? It just wasn't working. There's too many cool. people doing giveaways at the same time. And, uh, and so I ran that business into the ground, right? And so I had to pivot. I had to stop and say, all right, what are we going to do now? And, you know, I think the better in ideology is so valuable. And if I can take some time to speak on that, is that I created better in because I was very tired of the negative um, messaging in the veteran community, right? If you, if you tell someone they're fat every damn day, you're going to really mess with their, 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 their psyche. You're going to mess with their self-esteem. And at some point they might even believe it, you know? Um, and that's kind of what I feel has happened in the veteran community. Like we've done the negative, 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 like as much as, okay, veteran suicide is a, is a, is a serious thing. And we should always try and, uh, fix that and, and, and address that. But we've also used that messaging so much. It's so profound. It is in everyone's head that I believe we've almost created a self self fulfilling prophecy by giving others the answers that are finding crisis right they didn't they didn't learn how to be resilient right they didn't f- go to counseling whatever it is and we have guys who are committing suicide i believe that could have been preventable by the messaging i believe we should highlight our successful veterans i i believe we should highlight how someone has made success after service and they should be the light that people focus on and try and emulate and try and replicate Right. But to, for so for so long, for how many years, so many companies and and organizations have been developed to kind of attack this one issue. Right. And I said, this is one issue in the veteran community. There's tons of issues. Right. But this is one issue. 
And they've highlighted this issue to the point where even Hollywood only talks about veterans in a negative light. Veterans commit suicide because of death, blah, 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 right? right? And so what we've done is created this negative messaging that is absolutely ridiculously unhealthy subconsciously to veterans around the world. You can't avoid talking to anyone who talks about veterans and then doesn't add the 22 a day, right? Which right. that number we, we all know is kind of, mis, you know, is not accurate because when you hear 22 a day, you think about combat veterans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Not true. 22 a day means anyone who's ever served in, in since when they did the original study. And so that means guys who've never even been to combat. So when you, when you identify 22, you start thinking post-traumatic stress is untreated. Yeah, that happens. No, no, no. It's more than that. Americans, it, it has a national epidemic of suicide, right? Suicide is a thing. We have to figure that out, right? As a whole, right? And so do veterans commit suicide more often than civilians? Yes. Uh, but, you know, veterans also do is find success and build million dollar companies and, and become, you know, leaders in a church or become corporate managers, right? Like there's a lot of sure, things that 100%. veterans do. Entrepreneurs, yes. yeah, nonstop. I know but many of for them. For some yes. reason, yeah, yeah, we we both know tons of them. Ton, yeah, right. The problem is everyone has jumped onto the negative messaging. Think about in a business. If how would a business do if all they did was talk about how bad they are? That's yeah. not a good way to market a business. That's not a good yeah. way to get people to jump on board, right? We inadvertently have told the communities that don't understand veterans like civilians who, who, who care about us, we've told them we're broken. How is that going to be when you go and try and get hired at a job? Right. So we've, we, it's, it's an accident, right? We didn't mean to do this. We like, it's just like, it's just like, uh, you know, you thought you were doing the right thing and then you see the, 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 the negative backlash that happens from it or, or like the residual effects of telling someone their whole life that they're, you know, there's a chance you might be a statistic. People start to believe it. Right. And so I created better and to be a kind of a, more of a positive outlook for veterans be better do better do more right and so that's what veteran.com is it's all it is it's nothing it's nothing fancy it's just some shirts i believe in every message i put on these shirts because i rep that i rep it as in the sense uh -huh. that i've either wrote it i thought it i created it you know i believe in it uh, i believe i'm only one veteran out of thousands and thousands and thousands who have found uh some relief after service and found a path that they have found some success in and, you know, because I have a platform, the biggest influencers of our time is, you know, film and television and social media. You know, I would love to see more film and television being told in an honest light and focusing on other problems, not just right. that, because we're more than that. We're, we're, there, there's more layers to a veteran than that. As, at the same time as social media influencers, I would hope that they stopped promoting such the negative side of who we are, right? They start talking so much about the negative and not start talking about the positive, like start highlighting successful fucking dudes. So people have someone to look forward to. Someone has people are like, man, I want to be like him. Right? right. I want to be like, like, I mean, there's, there's a list of them. Like, I want to be like them. How do I be like them? What's the path that they took? What did they do to become like this, this millionaire or, or, or just happy? How do they find happiness? Just, like Mickey Mantle you know, was in the army, happy. right? It's like he right. became Mickey Mantle, yeah. Dude, you know, so, it's like to play baseball, that's what I'm right? Saying. You know, Disney got a bad de yeah. conduct discharge, but he's still Disney. He was in the military. He had a story of his military yeah. career and it was a bad discharge, but he's still it, Disney. It's a crazy thing, man. That's, that's my point is like, there's a lot of success and we have not done a good enough job in representing that veteran success, winners, winners, winners. And we should be highlighting the winners yes. because that's going to give our young veterans opportunity. And you know what the other residual effect is? You have less people wanting to enroll or, or join the military. Right. It is the, we've not met our numbers in recruiting. Why is that? Well, yeah, because everyone's like, oh, hell no, I'm not going to let my son join because he's going to go suicidal. Happen to them. Bullshit. Yes. Yeah. No, right. I don't want my we've, son, we've I don't want my son to that. Yeah, we've, exactly. 22 a day, son. We've told Here's some the Adderall. My son's, <laughs> don't dude, join the military. <laughs> bro. Uh, I, I know, drill sergeant. The military and I'm like, cool, dude. <laughs> I know, dude. My son was doing the military. I said, go for it, dude. Let's, let's find what job you want to do and let's yep. do it because it is giving me opportunity. The military gives lower income opportunity that they never would have had it is a jump in the social economic stance it just is you want to find a way to make more money than your parents ever made if you're if you're if you're in poverty 
Join the military. Join the military. Join a smart job. Do 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 any. Yeah, you don't have to be infantry. You can do no, so can many avionics. things. You can be a respiratory therapist. Yeah, right. That's my point. And then you get out and do that for Boeing, and you're making good money. Correct. You know what I'm saying? It's like you want to change your social economic position. Be smart enough to join one of the military services and pick a job that you can get out and make eighty thousand a year. And you're gonna be like, yeah. damn, that was a good choice. Going in as a sniper. You, you know, there's an opportunity hard for, there that people. How do you get to be a sniper outside of being a sniper when there's like one on a police force? It's like you, you gotta. I know, man. You yeah. know, and and these guys are real too. You gotta right? use the system. <laughs> yeah, you gotta use these, the system. You gotta be use the system in a way where it's gonna benefit you. Yes. And you know, I was not one of the smart ones who did that. I just did infantry ranger. But once I got out, and I was blessed to still be alive, right? Because you know, you, we, not everyone makes that makes it out of there. Uh, I was able to say, hey, here's what I'm going to do with this opportunity. Keep going. Yeah. And I just want others to believe in the same thing. I want others to see that how they can do so much more with themselves and that the only person standing in their way is themselves and their their mindsets, their their ideologies that are completely wrong. It's totally, it's true. It's true. And that's really good positive words that you just put out there too. I mean, if somebody doesn't you. Um, encourage you, you may never uh, try it. So let, let Rocco, let Vincent here be some encouragement in your voice. If you're listening to this and, and go, go try that, your, that what you're passionate about. If you're passionate about it, chances are you'll make it successful because you believe in it so much. Even if somebody tells you you're never going to succeed at it. Hey, do you like my business idea? It's this, um, that widget. No, it's not blue enough. You're like, you know, I think it is. I'm going to walk away from you and I'm going to continue to pursue this widget. And then all of a sudden your widget takes off Yes. and it was the right blue and everything that you I'll thought you about this. it was correct. And all these naysayers out there are just like, the can last, I buy yeah. your stock? <laughs> Yeah, I know. Last thing I'll say, Brad, is this. When I wanted to try out for, I wanted to audition for Mayans, I called someone that I knew that was in Hollywood at some point and they were just, you know, they knew the system. And he said, I wouldn't even try it, dude. Every Hispanic in Hollywood is trying. I would just go for something else. And I was like, nope, I'm going to try. That's what I and needed. And now here I am, five seasons later. That's what's up. That's what you needed. And sometimes, yep. tell me no. <laughs> That's all I need to hear. Yeah. Tell me no. That's it. You know, you know, so, well, with that Rocco, I'm going to go ahead and wind down our conversation. And I hope our listener had a great time as I did interviewing and chatting with you. I hope to have you back on the show when you have time available in the future. And we are going to be huge fans of yours. We're going to follow you all over social media. And I just want to say thank you for mm -hmm. uh, being in our United States military and providing the flag, which I sleep under every single night. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With, with that said, I'm going to say this is Rad saying peace.